Hello, welcome to the Criminal Justice Research Center talk series, um, the second one this semester. Um, and today we have our graduate student paper award winners. Um, this was a shared award, so we have two, two talks. Um, first up will be Ashley Rodriguez and Joe Risi. Um, and then second will be Emerson Waite. Um, a little bit of introduction for each one. Ashley um, is a third year graduate student and came here from George Mason and is still working with um, Evan Louder there. And they have a couple papers that have R, R and R's. Um, one is a judge survey um, about risk assessment. Um, and Ashley has a paper with me that uh, is coming out in American Sociological Review um sometime next year so um and she is interested in uh, multi-level analyses of the socioeconomic contexts of of sentencing of courts and how that shapes sentencing and other social contextual features and how they shape what courts do um joe um you're a fourth year fifth year fifth year um joe is a fifth year student who's uh, um, ABD and is interested in a wide variety of things and just had a first authored criminology publication that came out with Karina Greif um, on police, um, police behavior and uh, police organization. And that's one of his interests in his dissertation. Um, and he's also interested in consequence, um, aggregate consequences of incarceration and courtroom social networks. Um, so um, he's working on a lot of different things. Emerson, um, Emerson is a fourth, sixth, sixth year. <laughs> now, when you've been here as long as me, you know, <laughs> you, know you know, you lose track of everyone. Um, sixth year student who has worked almost the whole time with the Pennsylvania Commission on Sentencing and has been an invaluable part of their research efforts there. Um, Emerson uh, did his thesis on um, spatial context, spatial proxy, spatial um, influences on court sentencing, um, and the context of of surrounding counties on on a given county, and what you know how they their sentence severity, and is also interested in. Um, different problem solving courts such as veterans courts um mental health courts and so forth this again emerson has a wide variety of interests and um and all kind of around the courts and criminal justice system so um i believe ashley and joe will are going first and then emerson so I'll just um, let the let stand in front of the camera because when you go to share your screen, we won't see you. So, Joe, if you want to come over so we can see you, I'm just saying hello to the people out there. Yeah. Uh, uh, All right. And introduce your talk. Oh, you're getting lots of hearts, by the way. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to just share. Okay. And then you can move this, Joe, if you could move the banner. Um, but... Next to the door, that's fine. There's a pole in the back of it. If you can. Thank you, John. Which way, Shimmy? Just oh, lift it up and shimmy it over. Keep going. Keep it next to the door. Oh, okay. Yeah, there you go. Oh. There you go. Thank you. <clears throat> we good? You're good. Okay. So, hi, everybody. My name is Ashley Rodriguez, and I'm with uh, Joe Risi. And we're presenting a, a, our project that we received joint funding for. It's called Who's on Your Case? An Examination of Pennsylvania Courtroom Work Groups. So um, once a, somebody commits a crime, they're arrested and then they're booked into a jail. And, you know, they, they're brought before a judge and they're told their charges and their, you know, whatever their charges are. And then the, a judge has to decide how that defendant will be held until their case disposition. So whether that's a case dismissal, whether they're going to be sentenced uh, or something to that effect. And um, at these first appearances, they're not typically studied. They're not really captured in most uh, as data sets because it's usually not the final outcome. It's just a preliminary step before somebody's case is over. Um, but those 
defendants who are detained have really, uh, there are really harsh consequences for them. They're more likely to be, uh, to take plea bargains. They're more likely to be incarcerated, have longer sentence lengths, and just generally, you know, having worse uh, post-sentencing outcomes, such as employment opportunities. And so it really matters who's being detained and who's not. And there are a couple of lines of thought on how, how uh, people are uh, detained, right? You could look at their case characteristics, right? Is it their criminal history or is it their offense? Or you could also look at their, uh, like who they are as a person, right? Their race and their gender. And that's like one line of thought on how you can try to uh, determine who's being held, uh, who's detained pretrial and who's not. Uh, a different perspective is to look at the courtroom work group network, which isn't usually looked at in um, sentencing research in the courts overall, because it's just a really hard uh, data set to get, right? It's usually hard to identify judges, prosecutors, and defense attorneys. But informally, we know that these networks are um, likely very important in making these decisions. So the courtroom work group theories, um, you know, posits that judges, prosecutors, and defense attorneys each have their own goals, right? Judges want to move things along really quickly. Defense attorneys want the best resolution for their um, defendant. And prosecutors usually want convictions. And so they have these separate goals, but they all have to come together to figure out a way in which to make sure everybody's goals are met while moving forward with cases. And so they all have to, like, because they all have to work together, they uh, establish different norms on how to resolve cases. Are we going to plea bargain and how are we going to plea bargain? Is it something that a prosecutor brings forth and a defense attorney just accepts it or are they negotiating back and forth? They also have different uh, prioritiz prioritization of focal concerns. So does this judge care about criminal history more than perhaps the defendant's rehabilitative, rehabilitative potential? Are prosecutors worried about the defendant's employment? And so these, um, and so then uh, another aspect of courtroom work groups is their stability and familiarity. So stability, so if me and Joe are like a prosecutor defense attorney pair, we might work really well together because I know what Joe will accept and he knows what I'm willing to accept. But if somebody like Jeff were to come in as a new actor, we don't know what he wants. And so we might run into more conflict trying to figure out how to make decisions. And so stability is an important feature of these courtroom work groups. We also have similarity in that uh, sometimes it's easier for uh, court actors to work together if they are from similar law schools uh, and similar demographic characteristics. And so these different aspects of courtroom work groups can create different types of uh, outcomes for those defendants based on the different configurations. What And um, research so far has shown that um, judges and prosecute, prosecutor familiarity tends to decrease the odds of trial um, because they tend to know each other, but when you have a familiar defense attorney, that uh, kind of reduces their ability to uh, work collaborate, collaboratively together. Um, stable courtroom work groups were also less likely to issue fines or restitution. This is their <clears throat> kind of inability to um, accept new policies that are coming out, because in that Haynes study, there was like a new policy that, okay, we're going to try to institute fines or restitution and those who are more stable or less uh, willing to um, to go with the new policy. Um, and so, and like, just kind of like broadly, like without looking at uh, the different aspects of courtroom work groups, just looking at the different court actors themselves, we see that judges and prosecutors by themselves are very important decision makers of uh, sentencing outcomes, but prosecutors tend to moderate the effect of judges. And so this kind of brings in uh, this, Kind of dyad shows the importance of looking at courtroom work groups. Um, something to note about this type of research is we typically don't have the triad, the prosecutor, defense attorney, and judge, even though that's how most decisions are made, because we're usually lacking one of those, one or more of those uh, court actors in our um, data sets. And so our current study tries to build upon this prior work that is really lacking in courtroom work groups overall and asks how does the courtroom work group configuration, so specific judge, prosecutor, defense attorney, affect first appearance outcomes. So we're not particularly worried about, do they have, are, are they the same race? Did they go to the same law school? That's something that could be done later down the line, but we're trying to model our, our, our study after Kim and Alls, who just looked at the specific configuration of actors. And so what we're hypothesizing is that the courtroom work group triad, so with the three actors, 
will have the largest variance or explain the largest variance in first appearance outcomes when compared to like uh, pairs of court actors or single court actors, just as Kim et al. found. And when we're trying to like rank these dyads or these try uh, these dyads, we're you know expecting that the judge prosecutor dyad will be the most will explain the most variance, similar to Kim et al. Um, simply because that prosecutor is a very important actor within um, within the decision making process, and that's been shown um, in other research. And kind of following that logic, we're also expecting the prosecutor and defense attorney dyad to also be like the second most powerful, just because the prosecutor will be in that dyad and is pulling some of the influence into there. And that will be followed by the judge and defense attorney dyad. So our data set is uh, we're pulling, we're web scraping uh, court dockets off the Pennsylvania Unified Judicial System web portal. It's their administrative office of Pennsylvania court dockets. Um, and this is a pretty, you know, unique data set and it's pretty robust. It goes back to 2003, 2006, depending on which county they kind of uploaded uh, court dockets on that kind of standard scale. And so that gives us, you know, almost 20 years of data to work with, which is, you know, uh, it, it helps to establish kind of um, these courtroom workers to see how many times they work together. Um, and so it's going to be a really rich data set. It's going to have like identifiers for each uh, court actor, and it also have our standard uh, variables that we want. So those are dependent characteristics, case characteristics, and importantly, the first appearance decisions. And while you could use a sentencing data set to kind of, uh, like just like a, a sentencing data set, usually they don't have those first appearance outcomes. We don't know who's detained bail. We don't know who's been uh, held in jail because they were unable to afford their bond. And so this data set will, you know, give a list of these first appearance outcomes in addition to sentencing outcomes, which is something that, that could be looked at later on. So I'm going to walk us through quickly kind of uh, what the data looks like in its raw form uh, to kind of give you a sense of, of why we think this data has so much potential and is going to be so useful. Uh, and so the first the first data kind of cleaning or collection step, which we actually just completed, was basically the uh, the Pennsylvania kind of web search portal is uh, right is that it's a web search portal. And you can't just say, give me every case, uh, please. Um, you have to, there are a lot of restrictions. So usually you have to look sort of by like what's called an OTN number. Um, but if you don't have a complete list of those, what you can do instead is you can search by date um, and then go systematically, you know, date by date, county by county. So that's what we did. That took a very long time. Uh, and that was, when you do that, it gives you links to the PDFs uh, that are the court summaries and docket sheets. So that's what we did. We got all the links. Uh, and then there's also some kind of information you can capture uh, from there, which we'll get into a little bit later. But now we're in the step of actually downloading the PDFs. Um, and so these are kind of what the PDFs look like in general. And so here, sorry, it's a little blurry, but you can see we have who was the judge assigned to the case as well as some of uh, the OTN number. Uh, we have really importantly, the bail information. So was bail set and for how much? Uh, and then in this case, this person had ROR, release on recognizance, so no bail was set. Um, we have what the current charges are. So this person was uh, arrested for a DUI. Uh, and then importantly, allowing us to kind of uh, get the courtroom, full courtroom work group configuration, we have who the prosecuting attorney was, and who the defense attorney was. Um, and then we also have uh, defendant characteristics as well. So we have their home zip code, uh, their date of birth, and then their sex and race. Uh, and in some cases, we even have their eye color and hair color. Uh, remains to be seen how well filled in those will be, but it's kind of a fun little variable that I don't think any really sentencing studies have looked at either. Um, and then we also have their criminal history. Um, so they've been arrested for a DUI before. Um, but so this should give a sense. One, right, this is very rich data. But two, it's in this PDF. It's not in nice rows and columns like we're used to analyzing. So after we download the PDFs and we estimate, so right now there are about 4 million uh, criminal cases across all counties from starting from roughly 2003 to 2006 all the way up to 2023. That's when we stopped data collection. Um, 
not all those criminal cases are going to refer to uh, right first court appearances specifically. So it's going to be less than that. How much more or less? We're not exactly sure yet. Um, but that's definitely the upper limit. Um, yeah, and then to actually extract this data and put it into rows and columns, uh, we're working, uh, and so this is what the grant has been very helpful for, is we've been working with some data science consultants who have experience in like extracting text from unstructured or semi-structured PDFs and then putting them in rows and columns. Uh, so that's what we're doing. We're kind of doing the two in conjunction, downloading the PDFs and then extract them. Uh, and so uh, in terms of getting more into the nitty gritty or operationalization, these are kind of the variables we're looking at. Uh, and as mentioned, the independent predictive variables, we have judge, prosecutor, defense attorney, and then course and case, course, court, uh, sorry, defendant and case characteristics. So current charges, criminal history, race, sex, age. And then we may also be able to include things like maybe eye color, hair color, maybe blonde eyed haired people get some sort of privilege or something. Um, pretty privilege. Um, and then the outcome variables, they're right. Outcome variables uh, we're planning on collecting. And then we're anticipating perhaps for first set of analyses, just focusing on like a binary, was the individual detained or not, or was bail set or not. Um, as we get more into it, we might explore, you know, perhaps like a multinomial approach, like um, considering categorical outcomes. Um, but to start, we're kind of just focused on a yes, no decision. And so the analytic strategy, heavily inspired by Kim et al, 2015. Um, so this is a figure from their paper and we're modeling what we're doing off of what they did. So um, traditionally, or maybe not traditionally, I don't know if that's exactly the word, but some papers, have modeled courtroom work groups like this, where cases are nested within prosecutors, which are nested within judges. And Kim et al. say this is not the quite correct way to think about it. What is a better way to think about it is this kind of configuration, what they call a cross classified model. So cases are nested within judges and nested within prosecutors. And there's not necessarily a, a clear nesting between prosecutors and judges. And the way that that gets modeled. Uh, this equation here, it's a little complicated, but it's actually not that complicated. It's just the symbols aren't in English, it's a little scary. But the way you basically model this with interactions. And so you can think about it, uh, there's going to be random effects for judges. In that case, it's just like a switch on and off, you know, for this particular first quarter appearance was prosecutor A here. Um, and then another, you know, another switch with the prosecutor B. And then same thing for judges. Um, and these are just, you can think of them as random level intercepts. So, you know, if this judge was present, how much did that increase or decrease the odds of receiving bail? Right. And then the cross level or the cross classified, what that does is as an interaction term. So here that would be the interaction of a judge and a prosecutor. So, you know, if judge A and prosecutor A were on this case, how much did that increase or decrease? The likelihood of bail. Uh, and then what we want to do is we want to add the defense attorney into the mix as well. So that will add more dyads. So two more dyads, judge and defense, prosecutor and defense. And then we can also add the full triad. Um, and the idea here is to then look at the variance in these intercepts. So you have 10 judges, some judge, and then right, controlling for kind of the case characteristics there's going to be some amount of variance in those judicial effects. Some judges might be more harsh, some judges might be more lenient. And then we're going to try to understand when we add in these courtroom, other courtroom work group actors, how does that change the variance, say, in judicial decision making? In the Kim et al. paper, they actually found that the variation in judicial effects basically goes away once you include the prosecutor and especially when you include the dyads. In other words, they were arguing that judicial effects were mostly moderated by who the prosecutor was. So, and in the beginning, that's what we talked about. And I think, you know, I think we're going to find something similar, but we don't know. Hence research. Um, so this is, so, because we're still in the process of data collection. Um, we don't have a lot of data to show, but we do have something. Um, so here, the x-axis is you know for whichever judge it's so the rank ordering of judges within county um 
And so judge number one in whatever county is that judge, that's the judge who heard the most cases in that county over the entire time period. And the y-axis is the percentage of cases heard by each of those uh, judges. Um, and so, and this is actually pretty stable over time as well. So if it, you know, in this county, Warren County, this judge number one, they heard the most cases like almost uniformly across all years as well. And so what we're seeing here is that interestingly, for, at least for criminal cases, in many counties, it's mostly, you know, a single judge, maybe two judges that's hearing the vast majority of cases. And this kind of informs us moving forward um, that there may not be a lot of judges uh, within counties, and maybe we have to focus our analyses on bigger counties. Um, but yeah, it's just something to think about. And this is also isn't 100% accurate. As you may notice here, Philadelphia, according to the data, there's only two judges, but that's obviously not true. Um, it's just the way that the kind of, because it uses, we're using court offices here as a proxy for judges, and Philadelphia has a unique kind of court office structure, and there may be other counties where judge and court office is not exactly one-to-one. -one. Um, but yeah, and then our next steps, as I mentioned, extract the data, code the criminal histories, run more comprehensive statistics and methods models, and write a paper. <laughs> thank you, everybody, and thank you for to the grant. That's our talk. Do we do questions now? Or we do questions at the end? We have lots of applause coming in from the Oh, thank you. Thank you, Zoomers. <laughs> do we do questions now or at the end? Why don't we do them now and then we'll do it. I don't have any online. Are there any? All in awe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll go. You know, you go. I know. Based on your you reference, the criminal it sounds like the main finding there was the prosecutors were moderating judges in that reference. How do you know? How do you model so you know if the prosecutors moderating the enforcement is the average or not? There's, I guess, like, what's what's your logic that's like establishing? So in the Kim et al. paper, what they did was they first just included judicial effects, uh, like a model with just judicial effects, and then they introduced prosecutor effects, and they found that the variation attribute or the variation in judicial effects greatly decreased once you included the prosecutors, uh, and then they included the dyads, and they found that variation and prosecutorial effects remained about the same, while the variation attributable to judges decreased even further. Um, so I think we would do something similar where we would estimate sequentially models by systematically, you know, including certain effects and then seeing how the variation changes. So according to your descriptors, it does look like you have a lot fewer judges than you might have prosecutors. So how do you know that's not a function of the Right. So we might have to limit our analysis only to larger counties like Lackawanna or Erie or Allegheny, Allegheny uh, to ensure we kind of have enough variation in judges uh, to get that. Yeah. There's a suggestion given you're thinking about network analysis in my last one. The professor wanted to get more about this information because maybe there's some some system of logging or normative sharing of information in order to affect decision making. So we have to completely know that. Yeah, I mean, Philly is just weird because it, at least on the dockets I've looked at, we don't list a judge at all. So it's like we're missing that one piece of the triad. And that's part of like the issue. So like Philly might not be a part of the analysis because right here it's only identifying uh, two court offices. And then when you're looking at dockets, right, that's part of what we're going to look at to see like how the data turns out, right? Because maybe I just looked at dockets in years that were just odd or something to that effect. But uh, Philly might have to be dropped out because it's not listing that one diamond or that one person or that one uh, member of the triad. But there still could be value in looking at just the prosecutor and defense attorney alone. So, but that's for down. So, 
the first appearance is typically in front of the district justice and magisterial district justice courts, not the common pleas courts. Um, and it seems like that's what you're picking up um, here. For example, I'm seeing looking at Blair. I happen to know that Blair has three common pleas judges, but you have how many, however many judges there? Uh, um, six. Six. So those are um, your your. So if you're going by judge name, what you're getting is the magisterial district justice court or judge who heard who saw and, and made the bail decision. Um, and so that's something you'll have to be aware of and um, think of. And that's probably your Philadelphia problem because Philadelphia and parts of Allegheny, Pittsburgh itself, do not have magisterial district justice courts. They have municipal courts. Um, and I don't know if those report. Um, I know Philadelphia municipal courts don't report sentencing information, but they can sentence up to like misdemeanor threes. Um, I don't know about the report, the reporting from municipal courts from Philadelphia might be problematic, might be why you're not finding judges in Philadelphia, that they're in municipal court and it's its own little world. Um, so anyway, that a suggest to keep, you know, understand that you're not looking at common pleas court judges here. You're looking at district justice courts, um, which of which there are many more than common pleas judges. So, for example, center uh, right here in state co greater state college, we have like four, five, and our center county only has, I think, again, three judges. So, but we have five MDJs right here in state college area. So, anyway. But if you're picking up, if you're going by judge name, then that's who you're getting. So you're you're getting the right judges. You just have to understand, okay, that's what those judges are. Right, and there's always the possibility that they're like moving between positions, right? You might be magisterial district court, and then maybe perhaps move to common police court. True. Too. So um, I believe there's an identifier for like the magisterial and the common police court. So that's something. Yeah. So you so we'll have to. Yeah. In fact, there's different docket numbers. Yes. Yeah. Yes. There's CP and MJ. MJ. Yeah. There. Oh, then Queen. There, Queen. And Jeff may have already brought this up. You guys about a student that that we have been on his committee for yeah. years and years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Robert Hutchinson, and I think he has similar approach, similar data, and a very interesting hypothesis about the history of the relationships in the triad. And trying to test if, um, if especially if a prosecutor and a judge have a long history of having relationships uh, in the courtroom, and how that might affect uh, key decisions, or I think that's what you said. Yeah, um, which is really fascinating, right? So, how does a history end up in a, in a stable state? So, basically, they know how a prosecutor knows how to come into this judge's mm -hmm. office and get the decision that they want, or, or to throw out a case. And um, I wonder how time would work into what you guys are doing. Oh, that's how something you... you can factor in, right? If if we have like a if so, we're going to have the population of cases at least dating back to 2003, 2006. So I believe Metcalf and uh, Haynes, what they do is like a count of how many times this uh, pairing has appeared together, and so that's a way to. But it's uh, a triad. So right. So you could you... also look at how many times has this triad appeared on a case together. And so that would be a covariate that you would include in your your analysis. I think it would be a different modeling approach. It would have to be. <laughs> yes, it's, kind of a different, it's a different <laughs> research. It's a different research question, but one that is interesting and worthwhile to pursue. Yeah, I mean, you guys are focused on between the variance between and trying to isolate that and see where the variance lies. Yeah, but when you include the pre or the uh, time element, it really becomes something different, and it becomes much more network. In terms of transitivity, how does how time really have to think about? But you might want to consider dealing with conflicts. Yeah, uh, aside from just like including the control for year or something like that. Yeah, I mean, that's thinking about time objectively, but within the cases, there, there's also elements of history. But it, it gets very complicated. You guys are already doing some of the <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
a coin. Did you? Oh, uh, yeah. Assuming your results are the square, the policies are there any policy implications? Hmm. Any policy implications? I haven't really thought about anything. <laughs> um, I mean, you probably know more than me. I mean, with sentencing research, we know prosecutors have hold a lot of power in uh, courtroom decision making, even more so, some would argue, than judges. Uh, and so, assuming we find something similar, it might suggest, you know, some procedure, some policy for if you think prosecutors have too much power some procedure to limit the power of prosecutors. But I don't know what that would actually look like. I don't know mechanically, like how you could craft a law that would achieve that goal and that makes sense. Yeah, I think, I mean, like looking at courtroom worker research itself, right? Each kind of courtroom worker also exists within like a court community and they have their own policies and norms. And so you would try to impose, if you were to enact a policy, you would try to impose that on to them and they would be very resistant to like, whatever kind of change you would want, right? So if we're saying like, pros uh, let's say like certain pairings of judges, prosecutors, the best attorneys are resulting in like more people become, or uh, being held in pretrial detention, the a potential solution would be to mix them up. And so you would create a lot of uh, issues within those courtroom workers because it's like, no, my focus is on like pretrial stuff and I want to stay here. I don't want to be rotated into different elements or I don't want to work with certain judges or defense attorneys. So you're introducing a lot of um, kind of like if you were to introduce a policy, you would probably need a lot of resistance. But I'm, I'm not sure what else like policy wise this study is doing. It's an interesting tension, right? Because if you want to introduce the friction, it might be produce produce potentially better outcomes, like less pretrial detention. But then the courtroom actors themselves might be unhappy about it because there's more friction. Karina. I was just going to suggest, I mean, and there's probably situations where you have random assignment and act of actors. So if, if it is the case and you're finding, you know, clustering and discrimination of sorts within certain trials or certain acting guidelines, um, you could think about uh, going from existing policies where there's no organization and assigning the judges. <laughs> There's lots more questions and things to talk to Ashley and Joe about later, but we should get to Emerson. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, as Jeff introduced me earlier, I am Emerson Waite. I'm a sixth year in the criminology program here. And today I'm going to be talking a little bit about my dissertation research, which is looking at jail and prison sentencing in Pennsylvania. So the first thing I want to do is kind of differentiate between these two types of institutions. They're often discussed interchangeably, jails and prisons, as one sort of incarceration experience. This is true both with policymakers as well as in sentencing research itself. We'll talk about the incarceration decision. Is somebody going to probation or are they getting incarcerated without differentiating what kind of incarceration that is. And so first I wanna kind of talk a little bit about how they're different and why that's important. Um, so first is the purposes. For a prison, the purpose has and still is punishment. In addition to punishment, there is an argument that can be made that they're also for rehabilitation. Um, because of the uh, presence of programming that's available. Jails, on the other hand, were not initially used as specifically punishment, more as just like a holding place, uh, particularly for people who are being held pretrial, particularly for people who are prison inmates who might be testifying in a local trial, so they'll be held in the jail while they're in that locality. Uh, the second difference is population. And so because of their different purposes, these two institutions have different populations that they house. In prisons, you're um, going to see more serious offenders, and the seriousness can be either as far as their criminal history, 
whether they have a more extensive criminal history, more serious offenses as a part of their criminal history. And it could also be related to the offense that they committed, um, whether they committed a, a, you know, a murder, probably more likely to be in prison and in jail. Uh, as far as jail populations, um, a significant portion of jail populations are actually pretrial detainees. So individuals who have not even been convicted of a crime yet, so haven't been found guilty. So I think that really sucks. Um, in addition to the pretrial detainees, it is used for, for punishment to a certain extent, normally housing individuals with a sentence of less than a year. And then, uh, like I was saying, you also have people um, that may be prisoners that are in those jails because they're testifying in a local county um, court case that is going on. And so they'll be housed in that jail during the course of their testifying. Another difference between these uh, two institutions is their government. So uh, jails are run at the county level, whereas prisons are run at the state level. Um, this leads to a lot of variation because the state prisons get state funding. And so there tends to be more stability in the resources available. There tends to be more stability between prisons as far as what's available, whereas jails are governed and funded at the county level. And so there's huge variations as far as jail size, jail population, not just like who is there, but the number of people that are there um, and also the staff and resources available. And so those three things lead to different experiences. Um, in jail, there are less rehabilitative programs and so less programming altogether. There's more quote unquote dead time. So you're just kind of sitting around bored. Um, visitations also very different between jail and prison. When you're in a prison, you're most likely outside of your county of residence. And so it's much more difficult for your um, friends and family to come and visit you. And we know that social bonds are really important for reentry and uh, reducing recidivism. And so the inability for family to kind of get to you because you're in a prison is, is really challenging. Whereas again, jails are in the local county. And so it's probably easier for friends and family in your area to come and visit you and maintain those ties. So a little bit about um, the literature that has looked at jails and prisons. There are kind of three key studies that I'm gonna to touch on. Um, very broadly, these three studies point in the direction that we see sentencing differences in jail and, in jail and prison sentences. Um, the first two studies that I list actually use a trichotomous uh, dependent variable that compare probation to jail to prison. And so while they find that there are differences in who gets sent to jail and who gets sent to prison, they're a little limited in that they include probation as an outcome because it doesn't really help you see what's going on between jail and prison offenders. You're including people who can go to probation in your sample. It's not really looking at that question in my opinion. Uh, but what they've what they found, they have found racial differences as far as who gets sent to jail and who gets sent to prison. And then Fern, the last one, she actually did a multi-level uh, multi study. So she looks at county variation in addition to individual variation. Um, in addition to finding that age, sex, and case factors impact the odds of receiving a prison sentence compared to a jail sentence. Uh, she also found that income inequality, uh, percent evangelical, violent crime rate, and the region affect an offender's odds of receiving a jail sentence compared to a prison sentence. So, so these are just kind of highlighting the fact that they are two different outcomes, they are two different sentences, and we should be looking at them separately. Some limitations of these uh, studies, however, are the, the dependent variable that they use. Um, for my study, which I'm going to get into more, I'm looking specifically at individuals who can go to jail or go to prison. If they're eligible for a probation sentence, they're not in my sample. If they're only eligible for a prison se sentence, they're not in my sample. You have to be eligible for jail and eligible. For prison. Uh, the other thing that uh, is a limitation of these studies, especially for study, is a lack of corrections factors as a uh, independent variable. And the theory that I'll get to, we talk a lot about how practical constraints, specifically corrections resources, uh, may be a factor that influences uh, judges' decision making. So a little bit about sentencing in Pennsylvania. We are an indeterminate sentencing state, which means you don't get a flat um, years put on you, but a, a range. So instead of getting like a two year sentence, your sentence will be like one to two years. And so what that means is at the end of one year, you're eligible for parole, but you could spend that total two years in incarceration. 
your sentence is determined by sentencing guidelines. So that's based on your uh, offense and your criminal record. And basically those two factors are used to give the judge a guideline minimum recommendation as to what the sentence should be. And the judge can then use that guidance to impose their final sentence. And I just wanted to note that there are 62 county jails and 23 state prisons in our state. And here's a little map that kind of shows you where they are. Um, counties, pretty much most of them have a county jail and uh, prisons are kind of spread throughout, mostly in rural areas, but we do have one in Delaware County, which is outside of Philadelphia. Another aspect of my dissertation is looking at how the imposition of a law change changed the use of jail and prison sentences. So in 2008, the legislator passed, the Pennsylvania legislator passed a law that changed the criteria for determining whether you go to jail or prison. Um, in both in both stages, if your minimum, if your maximum is less than two years, you go to jail, and if your maximum is five years or greater, you go to prison. However, between this law change, if your maximum is greater than or equal to two years, but less than five years, it, it has changed. Prior to 2012, the judge had discretion as to whether to send you to jail or prison. After this law change, that discretion is reduced and the judge, it's now presumed that individual will go to prison. However, there is a, there is a set of criteria that will allow an individual in that sentence range to go to jail. So if the jail administrator, sentencing judge, and prosecutor agree, this um, sentence, this sentence presumed to be served in prison could actually be served in jail instead. And so the policy rationale behind this is, as I talked about, the purpose of, of prisons is to house these more severe offenders. And so what the legislator is saying is that housing severe offenders, these people with the two to potentially five-year maximum in jail is a burden. It's a burden on the county. It's they're not in keeping with the population that's normally in jail. It leads to overcrowding. And because prisons are, again, supposedly have a rehabilitative component to it, it's also potentially preventing individuals from getting uh, rehabilitative help in a prison. And so the goal is to reduce uh, county jail populations and relieve that burden, improve confinement decisions, and help people get the rehabilitative uh, help that they need. So I'm looking at county variation and the use of jail and prison sentences for this specific population. And my questions are, so how much does it contribute and how do county characteristics um, influence that, that variation? And I'm looking at uh, uh, racial composition, economic factors, and political factors. And then my last question is about the impact of the law change. Did it indeed increase the odds of receiving a prison sentence relative to a jail sentence? County contextual uh, theories uh, propose that as racial and economic factors increase, meaning as the racial minority population increases and as uh, poverty or unemployment increase, that we would expect increases in sentence severity. And this is as a result of conflict theories, the idea that people in power want to maintain their power and so they will use it um, to, to incarcerate individuals who they deem as part of the progressing minority. Uh, the idea is that the county context will then influence the court community. So what's happening in the county around you is going to influence the judges. And then who those judges are, are going to, um, and and how they are affected by the county is going to influence how they look at focal concerns. And so these main focal concerns are the individual's blameworthiness, like how responsible are they for their crime, their dangerousness, how criminal, how dangerous was their crime. Practical constraints, like I mentioned, what's the available jail capacity? And then salvageability is how rehabilitative, like what is the rehabilitative potential of these individuals? And so essentially I'm arguing that county racial and economic uh, characteristics and political characteristics are affecting the, the judges, which is affecting sentencing. Um, I kind of just went through this, but I'm essentially hypothesizing that county is going to be a significant uh, predictor, well, not predictor, significant contributor to um, the confinement decision, um, at, hypothesizing that as racial minority populations and ne negative economic factors increase, the odds of prison will increase. As political conservatism increases, so will the odds of prison. And then as corrections factors such as jail usage increase and having a prison in the county will also increase the use of a prison sentence. And then as far as the law change, um, I am predicting that the imposition of this law 
will be associated with an increase. Uh, for my data, I'm using 2007 to 2019 sentencing data. I am narrowing it down to the most serious offense in the judicial proceeding, uh, dropping DUI offenses because they're dealt with very specifically. They kind of like dealt with outside your usual guidelines. And then, like I said, I'm only keeping jail and prison sentences and I'm isolating it to those with a maximum of greater or equal to two years and less than five years. So keeping within that policy language. For my level one uh, measures, I got race, sex, age as a categorical variable, prior record score, offense type, the minimum imposed sentence, whether the individual went to trial or took a plea, and then the law change. And then for level two, I had a lot of multicollinearity with my black unemployment and poverty variables. So I used a principal component analysis to combine them, which seemed to alleviate the problems I was having. And then I also have a variable for political conservatism, crime rate, jail usage, and then if there's a prison in the county. Using multi-level analysis as it accounts for county clustering, which can cause issues with your standard errors. I'm going to present uh, my, mul my null model, uh, level one random intercept model, and level two random intercept model after I go through some descriptives. Real quick. So most of the descriptives, things are pretty e even between jail and prison. There's lots of numbers, so I just kind of want to draw your attention to things that stood out to me. Uh, first of which is we do see that there's a greater proportion of um, Black offenders in prison than in jail, comparatively. As far as crime type, drug was kind of really the only one that stood out as having a greater proportion of offenders in prison as opposed to jail. And then the pre-law change and pro-law change, you see a big, a big change, um, close to a 20, sorry, I can do math. There's a large, <laughs> there's a large change there between uh, before and after the, the law change. And then I also wanted to point out um, sentence minimum and maximum. You, there is a greater minimum and maximum sentence for prison than there is in jail. Uh, so this is kind of, I don't know how well you can see it on the screen. Basically, this is showing that Pennsylvania is a very white state. Um, there is an exception for Philadelphia County, pretty much, which is a really dark one. Uh, Dauphin County is kind of the one near the middle, which is where Harrisburg is, and then this is Allegheny County over here. Um, this is county unemployment. Again, there's kind of variation throughout, but we're pretty pretty steady between 2.5 and 7.5 percent. And then this is political orientation, a very conservative state as far as county distribution. Um, Philadelphia again is is not, um, but just kind of give you an idea of where things stand within our state. So my null model, again, is used to predict baseline proportion of the variance in the jail prison decision that's due to county. And I find it's at 0.287, which is about 30% of the variation in the imposition of this sentence is due to county. So that's pretty significant. A lot of um, sentencing research that reports in ICC will tend to see it between like 3 and 7%. So seeing something at 30 is really pretty outstanding. Um, and I think it has a lot to do with sample selection. Um, for my level one random intercept model, uh, race and sex do not have a st statistically significant impact. That's not terribly surprising uh, for race. We've seen those race effects uh, kind of decrease over the years. However, I was surprised that there was no gender effect because that does tend to continue to stand out. Um, however, age was still a statistically significant predictor, and it's in the direction that we would expect with categories outside of the reference category, which is 21 to 20, 21 to 34, um, being less likely to go to prison in that category. Uh, I was surprised by these uh, findings as far as crime type. It seems like almost every uh, crime type was less likely to go to prison than a property crime offense. My only thought process has to be something to do with like the plea negotiating component of it. Um, maybe individuals who have more severe offenses are more likely to take a plea that grants them uh, down or something. But if anybody else has ideas as to this outcome, I, I'm happy to take ideas. Um, lastly, prior record score is a significant contributor, so is sentence length. And then we can see that the law change did have a really significant impact on one's odds of going to prison. The level two random uh, intercept models, the uh, level one predictors were pretty much all the same. So just reporting level two here, um, pretty much none of them were statistically significant. The only one that stands out as marginally significant is whether there's a prison in the county. 
Um, the idea is potentially that in order to um, not have a burden on the county, the financial board burden on the county, that those counties might send people to uh, the state prison instead. Um, but that's unclear. And so discussion in future directions, uh, the individual factors were substantially uh, related to the jail prison decision. Even though county explained about 30% of the variation in that decision, the factors that I selected to include did not uh, were not very related to this decision. Um, the imposition of this law change did have a statistically significant, significant impact uh, to the extent of increasing the odds of going to prison by about 70%. Um, and then for future directions, I do intend to do a time series analysis looking at changes in the use of the statewide uh, jail and prison sentences, but that's ongoing. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Why did you do a PCA with uh, race and with economic characteristics of jail? So they are just very highly correlated. And so I wanted to include both of them in my analysis. Uh, and so at Megan's suggestion, she said this is kind of a way to account for that multicollinearity and make sure that you can still include all your measures that you that you want in the in the study. Um, my suggestion, like yeah. based on my like because I just did my thesis kind of with the same variable. Yeah, yeah. I'm reading is um, instead of using percent black, use percent Hispanic as kind of a proxy, and that shouldn't be related to any of the okay the variables you're using. So that's something to check later on. Thank you. Jeff, did you have a question? Oh, I was just going to offer a um, interpretation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that um, the violent effect, violent offense, that makes sense in the context of what window of um, sense possibilities this is. So it's two, you know, two years to five mm -hmm. years. Um, and so you're not getting the severe body, you're not getting the rapes and homicides and aggravated assaults and you're getting less serious violence so offenses. so you're suggesting that essentially i'm getting more severe property offenses and less severe yes. violent offenses. yes you're not getting the really severe violent offenses you're getting the simple assaults aggravated assaults with little less you know no bottom no serious bodily injury okay that um, makes a lot of it, sense it makes sense if you think of what window of sentences this possibilities this is is it also true that that really relates to drug crimes as well, where there's drug dealing instead of drug using? Yes. Because it is surprising that you're more likely to go to prison for a drug offense, but that's probably because you're selling it or you have a soul. Yeah, because lower level drug offenses probably are not captured in my my sample. Yeah. Do you want to explain that? Because it, it's current. Yeah. 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 It did not. Um, it didn't. It didn't seem to have any effect, which is not unsurprising. Um, I feel like that's kind of typical in what you see in in multi level, county level analyses. Um, so that that wasn't surprising to me. I I wish these county factors were more insightful, um, but no, no effect. Yeah, John. Two questions. One is how do you measure the the political uh, orientation of the county? Yeah, so I did the percent of the population percent of the votes that went to uh, George W. Bush in two thousand. No, who was the guy in two thousand eight? John McCain. Yes, yeah. McCain. Okay. Um, I won. I can. I I don't know a lot about. Like, I wonder if a different. A different metric. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. But I don't know what the other metric is. I mean, you can use, I don't know, you can go down a rabbit hole, right? Like, look at governor yeah. race or senate race. I, I had considered governor or senate at one point doing, like, a statewide race that's more local. Um, but the presidential elections is where you get the biggest turnout. Right. Um, yeah. And so that was kind of why I decided to go that direction. Yeah. Well, my second question was, um, what... This is uh this is beyond the right. This is kind of asking me speculate, but what county factor do you think uh, driving 
I don't know that. I think it's more court community related, maybe than county factors. Uh, Jeff, I think about your geographic arbitrariness paper and how um, the use of the death penalty is just it's not really. It's just kind of where it is, yeah. and I think it has a lot to do with um, how the judges and the prosecutors and the court itself determine like the uh, going rates essentially. Um, so I think it has more to do with the based on these findings. I'm thinking it has more to do with the courts than like the actual counties. Yeah, the counties are like proxies. Yeah, the court, courts themselves. Yeah. Um, is and is this an implication of that uh, interpretation would be that the county context either doesn't matter or it mattered or its significance? Uh, I I wouldn't say yeah I wouldn't say it doesn't matter um, but I don't think that the way it's being measured can capture it. Like I don't, based on my study and other studies, like the percent black in the county, maybe it does have a effect, like an impact, but the way we're measuring it does not currently show it. Is there a way we could measure that it would? I'd have to think on that. So, okay. Yeah. For the sentence length variable, do you have to predict, or is that the minimum or the maximum? Minimum. Okay. Yeah, I'd be, so it'd be interesting is to interact that, I guess, with the pre-law, post-law change, because with sort of the removal of discretion around setting the maximum out and the sort of artificial bound that there has to be at least that ratio of two between them. I wonder if there's a difference in the effect when judges lose that, lose that measure of discretion. Yeah, so I have looked into doing um, some multi-level models with like just pre-change individuals and just post-change individuals to kind of see how things um, adjust. I haven't looked at that in a bit, but I do remember the ICC's change a, a good deal, suggesting more variability after the law change, which to me suggests that there's even more kind of discretion going on with how this law is implemented. Yes. Do you know the financial impact of this law change? I don't I don't know the financial it's, impact on it. There's a 70% increase of going to prison, which is much more expensive than county jails. So yeah, I I don't know. At the at the same time this law was being passed, the state was also looking at um changing laws that were gonna adjust the prison population as well. Um I can't remember if it had to do with like parole releases or like changing sentencing or, or what it was, but at the time that they were trying to reduce these county um the, the county jail populations, they were also trying to reduce prison populations. So they were trying to almost like shift up so i don't know i don't know what the finance i don't know yeah i just don't know 